everybody, Andrew Holacek here, and I am particularly delighted to spend some time and introduce you to Maria Kurzelnikov, who I've known through the circuit, so to speak, through um, different events that we've shared over the last couple of years, and um, been trying for some time to find a mutual set up where we could get together and talk about things. So I'm very excited to introduce you to her amazing work and get into some really kind of cool stuff. So as usual, what I'm gonna do, I will read uh, a short uh, bio of her and then send some questions her direction. And we're just gonna jump right into some interesting things. So Maria Kozemnikov is an associate professor of cognitive neuroscience at the National University of Singapore and also holds a faculty position at Martin Hill Center for Biomedical Imaging, Harvard Medical School. She received her PhD from Technion, is that how you pronounce it in Israel? Yeah, Technion. Yeah, jointly with UC Santa Barbara. Prior to joining the National University of Singapore, she has held faculty positions at Rutgers University and George Mason University. Her research interests focus on examining the neurocognitive basis of visualization and creativity and investigating the ways to enhance capabilities of the human mind. Maria spent more than 15 years conducting field studies with experienced Tibetan practitioners in the remote monasteries of Tibet, Bhutan, and Nepal to gain insights into the unique neural correlates of these practices and the altered states of consciousness they induce. And so Maria, I just wanna give you a big hug. I'm, I'm so excited to talk about your stuff. You're doing some really, really interesting things. And I want to um, start at the outset. One, one of the things that, that I really want to focus on with you after I get how you got into this kind of stuff, et cetera, is something that we share a real uh, kind of common passion for. And, and this, in fact, I'm penning a book right now, literally tentatively titled, uh, entitled, OK, I'm Mindful, Now What? Exploring the wonders of the mind, um, because mindfulness, as we know, it's an amazing thing. It's, there's no criticism at all, but mindfulness does have its limits. And one of the things I'm trying to do with this book that you're doing with your research is introduce people to um, just a vast array of skillful methods that are available that transcend but include mindfulness. And your research is really unique in that regard. Of all the studies out there, and I've had a wonderful, probably eight, nine, 10, amazing neuroscientists on this podcast over the last three years. You're the first one who's really explored these tantric type of meditations in, in rigorous um, formats. So I, I want to explore those ar arenas with you. But before we get started, um, Tell us a little bit about how you got into this work. What, what was your inspiration? What drew you to this dimension of science altogether? And then after that, um, why the study of these unique um, tantric and really um, post-tantric meditations? So if we could start with that, that would be awesome. Okay, so my research, my main research in cognitive neuroscience is neural, neural correlates of mental imagery and visualization. So I study different types of visualization, which scientists use, which artists use, you know, the differences in neural level between these different types of visual images. And uh, it has been a, pr a problem for decades how to train visualization ability, how to train visual memory. So uh, we actually don't know this yet. We have pharmacological means, but we, we don't have any behavioral ways to train visualization of visual memory. So my interest to Tibetan practices started in 2003 or 2004, I don't remember, with MIT meeting. Uh, Dalai Lama was um, participating in that meeting and uh, the goal was, I think the name was investigating the mind. And the goal was to bridge neuroscience with um, findings of Buddhism about human mind. So, um, I was a participant in that meeting and it was a very, very interesting, somewhat heated debate between Dalai Lama and my, it was my ex-supervisor, Stephen Coslin from Harvard um, yeah. Psychology Department. Yeah. There was a very heated debate about um, visual memory of experienced Tibetan practitioners. So Dalai Lama said that 
the monks can maintain visual images for hours, for right. days. Right. And Steve, Steve said, oh, no way, no way. <laughs> he said in a way more rude way. <laughs> so <laughs> about it, so, yes. <laughs> right, exactly. <laughs> So, um, but I was actually, I was actually very interested. So I approached Matthew Ricard. Matthew Ricard. Oh, yeah. I know Matthew very well. Yes. What a sweet <laughs> I approached him after this discussion and I told it was just my sabbatical. I was assistant professor at Rutgers University and it was just my sabbatical year was coming. So I asked Matthew, can I actually, can I actually come to Nepal and measure, you know, this exceptional capacity of Tibetan monks? Yeah. So, <laughs> Actually, Matthew, by the end of the conference, he told me, okay, you can come, I will help you to recruit these monks and you can yeah. see what's going on there. So this is how it started. I went to Nepal. It was, I think, 2005 mm -hmm. when I actually got there and Matthew helped me to get uh, their practitioners. So I just need to tell a bit about this experience sure. because... Um, it was very disappointing at first. Yeah, I was I was doing different behavioral visualization tasks. I was given to monks. It was computerized test on you know on their visual memory capacity, and uh, they were pretty bad, you know. So <laughs> I was going from one monk to another, and it was just it was just Not below working. average <laughs> of Western population. So. Yeah. <laughs> After I was completely disappointed at some point, you know, I was running one monk. He was all the monk, like about 65. The test was extremely difficult for him. Computer was extremely difficult for him. Computer completely froze and completely broke. So I left, you know, the experiment. Then the next day I fixed my computer and came back. I mean, I didn't have any hope to get anything interesting, but I just needed to finish this experiment. So I came and this monk, I was waiting for him until he finished his deity self-visualization. He was doing almost one hour deity self-visualization. He came out from this meditation, he straight went to, to the same test. He couldn't even get through like five minutes last time. And suddenly, honestly, he performed everything exceptionally. I couldn't oh, believe. Wow. Oh, wow. So, so I asked, what happened? What happened? He said, um, oh, this is because I'm after this data self-visualization. I feel so powerful. Now I can do any, mm. any of your tasks. Give, give any to me. I will do everything. So actually, that was the idea. Maybe they, they get into some kind of temporary state after visualization, after data self-visualization, which helps them somehow to boost this you know, visual memory capacity. So I started actually completely redesigned the experiment and I was doing this measurement right after the, the self-visualization. And amazingly, you know, their capacity triple. So they were way beyond average now. They were way beyond Harvard students, you know, younger yeah. usually. So they were way beyond uh, their exceptional capacity. But this was a state, this was a temporary state. This capacity washing out, you know, so we don't know exactly how long it takes because it depends from many factors, how long they were in this in this meditation before that, you know, how well they slept, how much energy they had, but usually on average half an hour after half an hour mm -hmm. Be it a self visualization, you still see it's washing out during the next half an hour, but you can still see the effect. And performance is absolutely exceptional. So, this was my first finding, and I got extremely interested. And this yeah. is why I did a lot of follow up studies with Tibetan practitioners actually to understand what we're dealing Now, I compare these. Um, performance of monks after mindfulness meditation, after vipassana meditation, you don't see anything. You don't see this boost right. of capacities, cognitive capacities. You see it only after, so what I saw, I saw them only after um, deed self-visualization, actually, and all kind of emotional type of meditation. So compassion meditation mm -hmm. also has a similar effect, love and kindness meditation, not even among Tibetan practitioner, even among, you know, Theravada, mm -hmm. also cause similar effects. So emotional kind of meditations and uh, um, yeah, self is guru yoga similar. So anything which kind of involve emotion and based on this, my hypothesis was that they get into the, into the state of autonomic arousal. Mm -hmm. 
not relaxation, which is which is not right. stress, but right. it's kind of adrenaline rush, adrenaline rush state. So they get into this state which expand their capacity. And usually it makes sense because during this state, you know, like to be able to, to deal with threat or arouse and stimuli, usually people can access latent resources, you know, attentional and cognitive. So uh, this is how I think this is, this is working. And all my next experiments were actually to understand the mechanism of this enhanced cognitive state, states at neural and physiological level. So this is, I, I love this because it really does expand the rubric of the traditional, everything going back to Herbert Benson, right? The relaxation yeah. response and the literally thousands of studies that have exhaustively analyzed the more uh, parasympathetic, the quiescent um, capacities. And so it's like you're bringing uh, a scientific lens to the other uh, spectrum, so to speak, and introducing the community to all these other benefits that really, in a certain way, transcend, like I mentioned at the outset, transcend, but include mindfulness. But let, let's, let's identify um, and define a couple of things here, Maria. One is, tell us a little bit briefly, we mentioned Matthew Ricard, we should tell people a little bit about who he is, because he's, as, he, as we know, he's an amazing individual. And then also say a little bit about what, what actually Dieta Yoga is, because some, some of our listeners may not know that. And then maybe I'll say a little bit from a kind of experiential point of view, because one of the things that really excites me about your work is I've done the three year retreat. I've done all these practices. I've done Yidan practices for 40 years. And so finally, to have someone who's um, actually bringing scientific traction to these tantric practices that I've done for decades, I find really interesting. So tell us just very briefly about the, this amazing individual, Matthew Ricard, since you mentioned him, a little bit about deity yoga. And then from there, we'll launch into some of the specifics. Okay. So Matthew is. He's a French origin. Um, I think he has PhD in genetics yeah. from France, right? So uh, he left uh, France one long time ago, maybe like 40 years ago. And uh, he got interested in Tibetan Buddhism. He moved to Session Monastery, Session Monastery in Kathmandu in Nepal. And he, he actually started his practice very intensely there. So uh, right now he was uh, he was kind of was managing such a monastery from for a long time from administrative perspective, but he is also a great practitioner who spent a lot of time doing retreats and practicing Tibetan Vajrayana meditations in in Nepal. And it's really it's his it's his extraordinary facility um, bridging the world of science and spirit that has been an absolute goldmine for the scientific community because. I, I'm familiar with all a lot of the people in the mind and life scene. I know a lot of the people that you know, and it's it's like um, anytime we need a highly proficient meditator, we call Matthew or you call Matthew, or sometimes we get him in the scanner, right? It's like, yes, exactly. Yeah. And he, I, I want to mention him because if if listeners are not familiar with his work, he's one of the most beautiful human beings on this planet. I, I find him so brilliant so humble. I think he he was labeled once the happiest man in the world, right? Which he just really like, doesn't really like that epithet. <laughs> he's, he's just the most beautiful human being. And I got to know him quite closely when I was actually working. I, I helped set up a clinic at Sitchin Bumpa, so I know Rob Jim oh. And so I spent, I actually still have an apartment. Literally, I could throw a stone into, into Sitchin Courtyard. <laughs> and so I, I've been to Bhutan with Machu. And with Abdur Rinpoche, I, I, you know, so this is, these are my family um, yeah. members in that area. So I love them all dearly. And so uh, say a little bit then about um, what deity yoga is, because in, in Tantric Vajrayana Buddhism, it is a massive, literally some scholars have, have said that about a third of Tantric Vajrayana practice is really devoted to deity yoga, to yoga slash generation stage practice slash um, Yidam practice. And because so it's so central, let's let's tell our, our listeners a little bit about what that is and why it's it's a particular interest to you. I actually very happy that you mentioned this because I need to tell you honestly, when I submitted my first paper about the effect of DT self-visualization on cognitive capacity, you know, like a lot of reviewers came back to me 
apparently people from the field of meditation or meditation research. And their point was that I study some exotic, extremely rare and not representative type of meditation. You know, so yeah. this is entirely not true. It's so not this, true. Is, this is not true. This is some kind of Western, some kind of Western view of some people about meditation that this is extremely exotic and rare meditation. This is not true. This is one of the basic meditation in Vajrayana and Tibetan Buddhism. Absolutely. And it's also called uh, generation stages. Yep. So it's actually what it's supposed to generate for Mahamudra, for more higher level, you know, like meditations, it's supposed to generate wakefulness, a wakeful state of mind, based on which uh, one can practice later, let's say, Mahamudra or Dzogchen or other Tibetan practices, mm -hmm. non-dual awareness practices. So it's called generation or developmental stages, and they generate wakefulness for um for completion stages. Completion stage, this is kind of culminating stages mm -hmm. like ultra meditation. And one visualizes oneself as a powerful deity. It's multimodal mental imagery. Mm -hmm. It could be also a mantra, not just visual image, but it's self visualization. I'm the deity, my body, body of a deity, my mind, my mental state, it's all mental state and mind of a deity. So with all the attributes and symbolic. And I also need to mention that sometimes these images looks quite aggressive with blood, yeah, with, you do, know, yeah. stepping on human corpses and they seem aggressive, but um, it's actually to, it's actually, first of all, it's symbolic. And second, it's really to generate really wakeful, what I would say aroused state of mind, which is really widely awake because arousal in psychological terms, it is a state of being wide awake. Yes. Yeah, and there's a, let me just throw in a couple more things because in my training when we did it, and I've done, I've done this literally for decades, you mentioned two, there are actually three aspects of complete generation stage practice. Yeah. One is the one that you're focusing on, which you could almost say some teachers talk about it as, as a, a kind of a tantric shamatha. In other words, you use a self-generated image to stabilize the mind. That evokes particular clarity aspects of the mind, which by the way, parenthetically, maybe we can talk about this later. My experience around this in terms of the, um, things like lucid dreaming, dream yoga, is that in a very real way, when I really ramp up my generation stage practice, I'm exercising the same muscles engaged in, in spontaneous generation stage, which takes place in the dream. And so when I do that, my lucid dreams and my dream yoga goes way up, but that's a sidebar, we can come back to that. The second aspect that you mentioned is the symbolic aspect that you're doing and, and there you're wearing all these accoutrements and they're wrathful or semi-wrathful. And so each one, each aspect of the visualization has the symbolic counterpart. And then the third aspect is called pride of the deity where, and this is important because it's not just, well, <clears throat> as a scientist, you can maybe help me here. It's not just a cool cerebral cognitive event. There's an affective component. Exactly. The pride of the deity literally means like, hey, it's called Zigi in Tibetan. I am the deity. I, I, so fake it till you make it practice. And that's why it's called impure. There are three other, there are several other names for this. One is impure illusory form. It's a way to work with, um, de-reifying reality using the, the capacities of visualization. And the last thing I'll say that, again, I want to throw this out, not to intimidate or overwhelm our listeners, but just to show the depth, the nuance, the profundity, the scope of this family of practices. The other thing that these meditations do that's very interesting, Maria, is they're designed literally to, to purify birth. Generation stage practices purify birth. Completion stage practices purify death. And by what they mean in this capacity, birth and death are multivalent terms. What they mean here is it purifies the birth of the imagistic quality of the mind so that the mind isn't involuntarily driven by karmic impulse and non-lucidity, the usual churning that takes place because we're visualizing all the time. We're involved in a kind of anti-Yadam practice, a samsaric generation stage practice when we visualize ourselves as losers or schmucks or whatever, right? That's a negative inverse type of generation stage. And so this follows the, the kind of classic polymax when the mind leads all things. And so here again, just to show you the people the depth, if, if you visualize yourself in the Sambhogakaya form, that's another dimension of these practices, it really is like assuming an identity that is a higher frequency of your own being. That's the fake it till you make it part. 
And so the more you do this practice, the more you do, let's say one of the most famous ones is Tara. The more you do a Tara visualization, the more you invoke those Tara qualities within you, right? And the more of those then can you give birth to the Tara quality of your being. So I wanted to, to throw that out there and also to echo exactly what you said. This, is, this may be a limited to limited thinkers in the West, but these are extremely common practices in all the Tantra traditions of which there are many, and also in Hindu Tantra. It's just that the Western kind of scientific community has not wrapped its mind around these sorts of things. But let's go further now into your court, into your expertise. Why for the average listener should they worry? Why should they care about this? Why, of what benefit is it for them? What are the implications of this work? How can this, this discovery of the capacities of the mind be a benefit to um, a non-meditator or even a non-practitioner? What, what what's the cash value here, as, as William James put it, right? Okay, yeah. Okay, uh, before I go to practical application, I just mentioned about um, another practice like Tumo, which oh. is completion, just to say With that it's even higher, you know, not right. just arousal, it's even control of all these energies, control of arousal, control of all the like physiological states. So what actually it gives us? And um, here I want to mention the states which known in the literature, states of flow. Mm -hmm. uh, flow states, those states reported by people usually in dangerous professions or very creative professions. Mm -hmm. So scientists, artists, and uh, extreme sport athletes. So people report these states kind of this zone where they suddenly feel a, you know, like extra energy. They also call them, again, this is lake kind of terminology, adrenaline rush, because it's not exactly adrenaline rush, but it's called adrenaline rush states where soldiers in the battlefield. So they have these, they, they feel high and they really have this expanded, not only cognitive but also physical capacity so the body gets extra resources this is latent resources resources to deal with extremely important emotionally or physically survival kind of situation so you get this extra resources and you perform as genius so this is highly mm -hmm. creative states you know i interview a lot of visual artists and they actually told me that not only they're familiar with the states some of them can even say, looking at somebody else painting, whether it was actually painted in these states or not. Really? <laughs> yes. Wow. So they kind of can feel it, but the interesting thing, they completely cannot control it, right? So mm -hmm. it's like Musa, it's come and goes, you know, yeah. and they're lucky if it comes. So, um, so what I want to mention, what I want to say, I want to say that Vajrayana, throughout thousand years developed techniques actually to in a controlled way to access these states to maintain these states and actually to maintain the level and exit safely from these states because like look video gamers this is my kind of research in parallel they mm -hmm. also can get into the states mm -hmm. totally uncontrolled totally kind of you know they completely like crazy can play two weeks and then just crash completely. So they they don't know how to control it. They don't know what the experience, you know, but getting there, they cannot get out because it's really, they feel really high. It actually feels like a drug. Yeah. So, um, so what it can help, you know, like study these practices in more depth, it can help to build training, mm. training system for experts, you know, mm. just to, to beat all the records, to scientists, to artists. To be to use them in a very safe and controlled way without causing damage because if you stay there too long you can cause real damage to your whole nervous system you betcha yeah so so i think this is this is huge potential for humanity actually to boost our creativity so it's it, it's like to, it's like tagore said one of my favorite you know the bengali poet he said the greater the imagination the less imaginary the results that is brilliant. And, and again, it, this I, I love what you're doing because again, whether we know it or not, and, and let's let's take this now even a tad bit even bigger, because when you're doing classic generation stage practices, you're doing it in the context of what's called the sadhana. And sadhanas, as you know, these are particular, these are liturgical 
recitations, practices, some of which can run hours, where what you do is, is you create, in Sanskrit language, you create a mandala, you create a world system. And, and so complete visualization practices, they're, they're multi, uh, multifaceted. They're, there's the self-visualization component where you visualize yourself as Tara or Chakrasamvara or Hivaja or Vajagini, any of a, really hundreds of these different deities that again, represent these archetypal aspects of the awakened mind. Then you also have what's called a front visualization where you then visualize in front of you, literally, you, like today I could say to you, try to visualize in front of you a red apple. But in this case, you visualize a, a palace, a, a, a particular environment. And the whole thing is, is a type of elevationism. And by, and by this, what I mean, Maria, is instead of reducing everything to dirt, this kind right. of degraded, this is, this is, is elevationist. It reduces in a, de, in a de-reified way, right? It, it elevates reality into a pure expression in, in Buddhist language in the Sambhogakaya, which interestingly enough, according to Buddhist uh, theory, that's where the creative artists really go to generate their art forms. And that's why we're elevated by those art forms. I'm, I'm a musician. I love classical music. I listen to Beethoven and this is, this is music of the gods. He was, a, he was like channeling the music of the gods. And so it lifts me into that dimension as does Picasso or Renoir or Rembrandt or whatever. And so in addition to everything we're talking about here, these are elevationist type practices that lift us up. And so the reason this has cash value is because it can point out to us the contradistinctive practice, which is whether we know it or not in exactly the same way if we're not practicing mindfulness, our default, literally default mode network, as you know, is mindlessness. But here even deeper is we all unwittingly, unconsciously practice samsaric sadhanas, whether we know it or not. We're always visualizing the world in, in, a, uh, in the only way we know, which is this particular materialistic way. And therefore these visualization powers therefore end up really controlling a large part of our lives. So what I see you doing is just so brilliant, is taking this process, articulating it in the language that has credibility in the Western world, which is the scientific language. And then now again, showing the vast extraordinary implications of doing this using flow states and everything else that you're talking about. But in addition to any comments on that and, and how that lands with you, I also wanted to ask you, what is the relationship or, or any between studying this your gaming studies and also virtual reality. Because in a, in a similar way, when you engage in these practices, there's very much a, a kind of a virtual reality component. So has virtual reality also entered your spectrum of study yet and application in this area? Yeah, so um, I actually used virtual reality because it provides better kind of more realistic visualization. So you can actually get more more realistic images and especially if you play games in virtual reality you can easily get this three-dimensional they're realistic they you can actually easier it's easier to get to the state of flow but for me there is some a bit diff difficult to explain but there is some big difference between virtual reality and deity self-visualization okay because um how to say this while using virtual reality to get into flow, it's kind of external, you know, external visualization, which you use. And it's actually, it's actually going even deeper to some side because it's even less realistic. Yes. Yes. So you're even more deep into imaginary illusory world. Exactly. While deep visualization, you actually, as you said, you're trying to raise yourself above and actually to, to get to see the wall as it is in more pure form. This Beautiful. is not very scientific what I'm saying, but what I'm trying to say, uh, you're trying to break the limits of this world, of this illusory yes. world, not putting yourself further. Into, further into more and more illusory world. Exactly. So, <laughs> yeah. so another way to say this perhaps, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, is that virtual reality is almost like super samsara, right? In other words, it's it's another way to even get further into the exactly, illusion, exactly, right? exactly, yeah. And then and then, as you know, it's very interesting, right? When when people like gamers 
especially the Korean, they have, they have detox centers for the Korean gamers now, right? There's this alternative world syndrome that people spend so much time in VR. And I have to say the first time I did it, I, I spent a couple of hours in a headset. I could see how this could become somewhat problematic because it can really shake, shape shift your sense of, of reality. And, and, and on one level that's healthy because that can help you question the status of your reality. But if you, like you're saying, if you're lost in that virtual display, then that really is kind of a, a super samsara. But let's, let's return, Maria, if you don't mind, to um, people who don't do these practices, the, the actual um, implications of this for creative purposes and, and how you foresee, like throwing your javelin into the future, how you can see a kind of translational research, how you can see your work being applied for artists and for others who work in these dimensions. Can you say a little bit more about that? Um, yes, so um, I actually, you know, I was thinking it's probably, it would be very interesting to build some kind of training creativity program for artists, for visual artists based on, um, on these practices. So how to do it? So, um, because some processes of artists and how they get into flow is already similar to deity self-visualization. For example, they, they tell that they think about some paintings they want to paint, it's all in their mind. It's complete focus for days, for days. It's very emotional, this effective component, as you mentioned. So they actually fully concentrate and don't think about anything else. And this intense concentration, complete they completely ignore all the destruction during the time. They just kind of think about the painting. This can push one into flow. Now, um, we can use a lot of things here from uh, Tibetan practices. For example, um, for example, just to add some breathing exercises, just gentle breathing, which used in Tumo, can help to regulate the state. Because uh, based on my uh, research, so Tumo has several um, main practices. Mm -hmm. There is practice which use very forceful breathing and which mm -hmm. actually targeted to, to raise psychic heat. But there is also gentle breath, you know, which use mostly to maintain the state. Yes. So it actually maintains the state. Uh, so, for example, this gentle breath, it's easy to learn and it can help to maintain the state of this flow when artists get into the state. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they call that actually uh, the, the way I was trained. The term is um, is called vase breathing, where Pace, yeah, but yeah, it's you, gentle, gentle vase breathing, gentle vase breathing, yeah. where you hold the breath below the navel in the, in the hara area as a way to kind of stay centered and gathered. Um, and so, so you've mentioned this a number of times. Let's let's now um, ramp this up even a little bit further and talk about these even more famous um, heat practices, chandali tumo. And, and the type of work that you've done there, because I, I'm sure you remember, I think, I'm not sure if Herbert Benson did this, I think he did, but um, way back when, you know, they studied these, these meditators in Ladakh. Remember, have you seen the videos where yeah. these, guys, these guys are out there? Literally, it's unbelievable, right? It's frigid cold out, they're, they're doing the classic thing. They're dipping these blankets in water. They're putting the blankets on these monks where it's like zero. And instead of chattering their teeth off and freezing to death, they basically dry the blankets. And so outside of making for a really interesting movie or some kind of pyrotechnics, there's something quite profound and deep going on here. Um, so tell us a little bit about your truly groundbreaking studies with these inner heat yogis and yoginis, because here again, the potentials with this, once this is, is kind of harnessed, applied, um, the implications are really quite compelling here. So can you say a little bit more about what you've been exploring along those lines? And this is some of the stuff you did in, in Bhutan as well, right? Not just Nepal, right? Yeah, this is a recent study in Bhutan. The previous was in Tibet, in Eastern Tibet. So um, just a few words about Benson's study. He actually, um, I talked to his subjects. I actually interviewed oh, wow. them. <laughs> and oh my goodness, wow. They actually complain. They complain for many reasons because uh, it was not very natural environment where he put them and asked them to, to do this Tuma practice. Yeah, this yeah. is not how they usually do it. And I will mention how they do it. And then um, he actually, 
put this respiratory, you know, um, mask to measure respiration rate, which actually interfere with space breathing a lot and so on. So, um, and finally, like my problem with Benson research, he measure only a uh, thing, he actually found only temperature increases, which you call peripheral body temperature in, on fingers. So, mm. so it was no mm. core body temperature. Mm. So now I just want to mention that it's very easy to actually increase peripheral body temperature mm -hmm. just by using visualization. Mm -hmm. Now you cannot increase core body temperature because a lot of processes here at play. So you kind of can run to do aerobic, you can go to sauna, but then automatically the body regulated back to normal core body temperature, your blood, blood vessel vesalidate, you start to sweat and temperature goes back to normal. So, so the, the real interest to me was to see whether they can really increase core body temperature. Now, I know this is not the main, um, the main goal of TUMA, right. but, but it was extremely interesting to me from scientific perspective because, because it's not possible according to all medical sciences. Right. You know, the person cannot control their core body temperature. If you can control your core body temperature, it would mean you control all your you know, autonomic nervous system. Right. Actually, this is my mind over matter. This is you yeah. almost like, you know, so, Absolutely. so from this perspective, is it really true they can do it? Actually, they can do it. Um, and, um, and also another reason why it was so interesting because it's actually power visualization, right? Mm -hmm. And it's really about visualization, functional role, what visualization can do. So uh, my first experiment was in Tibet. I went there, this is a nunnery, Gepchik nunnery. It's in Eastern Tibet. And this is probably the only monastery in that area which still doing this yearly ceremony of dry and wet sheets. Yeah. So this is on the area which was historically area of these Tuma monasteries where previously they all were going out every year dry and wet sheets. Now I don't know how many how many monasteries left, but in that under um, area, this is probably the last which you do in kind of proper ceremony ceremony every year. And it was actually it was extremely cold. It was like minus 25. And um you cannot film this ceremony, you know, right. you cannot actually take any picture. And so I just watched together with locals. It was extremely cold. All locals were really warmly dressed. And then these nuns were going probably two hours, even longer around early in the morning around monastery premises. It's very colorful ceremony. They, um, they were half naked and they have very colorful short uh, skirts and mm -hmm. high boots. And yeah. they were taking these, um, wet sheets from Lama and they were, you know, like wrapping around their body. They walk until sheet dry out and then they were given to Lama this dry sheet and getting a new wet. So um, I didn't do any experiments during the ceremony because of course it's not allowed. They cannot uh, interfere, but I did with these nuns um, and monks from the same area, from under um, area, these experiments after the ceremony. So, I actually did find increase um, in core body temperature. So the highest one was, um, it's in Celsius. It was, so the monk was able to raise his temperature up to 38 degrees Celsius. So it's auxiliary temperature. I think it's about 101 or even higher in Fahrenheit in oral temperature, probably even higher. So it's kind of medium fever. And um, which is very interesting because again, it shows that um, they can actually do it. And the mechanism, now I understand, I think I understand the mechanism, how it works. They get into this paradoxically high arousal. It's paradox paradoxically high, you know? So, and they can control this level of stress. So it's very stressful state already. They can control it very effectively by using visual imagery, again, it's a flow state, extremely high visual imagery and intense concentration. And what happened in there, adrenaline, noradrenaline hormone is rushing into the bloodstream, mm -hmm. which actually help, you know, to regulate, to regulate core body temperature. And uh, even according to modern medical theories, there is a way if there is this, um, 
a lot of noradrenaline going into the bloodstream. There is a way actually to, to regulate core body temperature and warm up and heat the body. So this is, I think, what's, what's going on. But it's, it show extreme control over nervous system, which these nuns were able to achieve. Yeah. So yeah. A, cu a couple of things there. Boy, this is so rich. A couple of things is I, I also want to, again, speaking a little bit more from the kind of yogic practitioner point of view, people might be listening if they're not familiar with this going, geez, this is like super esoteric, exotic. Wow. Like there's 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 some near enemies if some of the deeper nuance understanding of what's actually this is about uh, if it's not understood it, and so let me just throw into the brief mix here that the tumult the, this kind of heat is a byproduct of the main practice it's not the target of the main practice no, no. that's important the the target of the main practice is is actually twofold one is to work with the uh, the energies of of um passion, the, the heat, the, the effective um, energetics that run the entirety of our emotional lives. We're driven by these energetic systems. And so what these practices do is they're, they're designed to heighten these extraordinary energies and then transform, you could say just in the biggest bullet point, transform the heat of passion into the warmth of compassion. That's really important because otherwise it just becomes this wily esoteric thing. The other thing, um, and there's so much to say here, but it ties in a little bit to the earlier practice, is, is the inner heat then practices are also designed to open up the body systems. Because when we do meditation, it, it's not about just opening the mind, it's also about opening the body. And Tantra, one of the things that characterizes Tantra is mind, body is as important as mind. So when you work with opening your mind, what Tantra does is it targets in a bi-directional way, it targets subtle body processes to open the body as a way to open the mind. And that's what happens when the body's open, the energy is released. And so therefore what that further does, and again, there's so much to say here, I don't wanna to go too far down this alley, but I think it's again, worth throwing in, like why do this? The other thing that this does is it helps to release all the knots the, the limitations, the blockages in the subtle body system. Because if you were, if you were to take, and this is where I wanna ask you a couple of questions, um, if you were to somehow take a, an fMRI or CAT scan or PET scan of, of a completely awakened being, you would have a very limpid, free flowing channel energetic system. If you were to take an MRI of, of me, let's take me, very confused sentient being, right? You would have, you would have a subtle body, with all, it would be like wrinkled saran paper, all knotted up and tightened and twisted. And so that when the winds flow through my channels, they're tied up and they're twisted and they're bouncing. And the result is a twisted bouncing up samsaric mind. So this is important because these practices are inner yoga practices and they're designed to open the subtle inner body. So I would counter, in fact, I wouldn't say counter. I wanna ask you this question. What you're sharing, um, Maria, are the measurable neural correlates of what these traditions would say are subtle body anatomical and physiological processes. In other words, the movement of the winds through the channels, the bindus, and the chakras. And so I am wondering, with that said, how does any of that kind of um, Eastern anatomy and physiology affect and inform your understanding or even your research? Is it, is it a sidebar? Is it of some philosophical interest? Or does it actually hold some empirical, clinical, and even scientific capacities in your work? Okay, so... Um, <laughs> is it okay if I ask you these questions? I will tell you honestly, there is no parallel in neuroscience language to subtle body system. There is, okay. no, there is no such language. We're too far away to study it scientifically so but whatever i kind of mind findings they exactly translate to what you mentioned about you know transforming passion transforming you know before before going to subtle body you mentioned about all these aspects esoteric aspects of tumor this is all could be translated into this terminology of arousal so what is arousal actually mm -hmm. this is energy you actually use energy in a very controlled way. You raise this energy and you, you, right, you right use it. it. Yeah. Now, it's not just 
when you're doing DET self visualization, it's not just random energy, right? It's a very refined already energy because you imagine yourself as a deed, it's very tuned energy. So you raise this very specific energy and Tuma allow you, so DET allow you to raise this energy. Tuma allow you to control this energy. Mm. So this and this energy actually, this is when you raise this energy, mm. you transform mm -hmm. all your passion exactly. into this energy of deity, you know, like, this more clean, pure energy. So this is transformation. Now, Tum allow you to control this energy. So in this way, probably in some sense, you know, it might allow you to untie the knot because it actually gives you control, gives you control in scientific terms of a sympathetic nervous system, which yes. is so maybe this is some parallel. It allows you to control your nervous system, control you all these energy you know, channels. But again, in strict sense, there is no parallel. There is no language. Usually, um, I tell you honestly, when I talk to some neuroscientists, they're extremely critical, even, even when they hear about these channels, you know, like, also I think, <laughs> It cannot be so, you know, because all this Eastern system talking about this energy channel system, there should be something we need to, we need to find some parallel, but so far there is no parallel in scientific language. So it's very difficult to. That's interesting. So, and so this is another reason why your work is, is so brave and almost heretical. And, and I can imagine that sometimes it's challenging for you because it can put you on the fringe of the scientific community where you're, you're really, you're stretching the, the paradigm, you're stretching the boundaries of what the Western scientific community understands of the nature of the mind and the body itself. So I'm, I'm curious how you, just as a brief side more, how you work with that. Are, are you confident enough with what you're doing that you, you allow these criticisms and whatnot to roll or, or how much, I'm curious how, how you work and play with these dissonance aspects. Actually, it's very difficult from both perspectives, from yeah. Tibetan as well, because, you know, yeah. Tibetan also not open to actually, <laughs> you know, for me to study these things and to publish these things. So, for example, I went through the whole process of talking to Turin Poche from Gepchik Nunnery, what I can actually put in the paper, what I cannot put in the paper. Right. And, and they were very helpful. But when I got into the Gepchik Nunnery, a lot of nuns didn't even want to participate yeah. in these studies because it was really, they, they give this sacred, you know, vows. They, they cannot disclose this. So Renpoche helped me a lot. He put himself all this, you know, EG system and all this temperature sensors to show that this is okay, you know, and the Dalai Lama already allowed Benson to study Duma practitioners, but it was difficult. So it was, it's difficult from Tibetan perspective as well. And of course, from scientific, it's also not easy, but um, I'm this is important, you know, what I want yeah. to explain. I study Vajrayana myself. I practice mm -hmm. Vajrayana myself. So, and on the other hand, I'm a scientist. So when I'm doing science, I'm a scientist. I only use cognitive neuroscience language. I'm not going beyond what is, you know, kind of yeah. be, at least in the papers, because the, you will, nobody will understand what you're trying to say, you know? So anyway, so I'm trying to keep it separate, but, you know, I'm trying to bridge them as much as I can at this point of time. So <laughs> it's it's a very courageous journey. And, and you may remember the very first book of the whole Mind and Life Dialogue series over 35 years ago. What was the title? Gentle Bridges. So <laughs> yeah. you're 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 creating yeah. these gentle bridges. And there's it's very interesting because there's there's dissonance on both sides, like you say. On one level, the, the, the practitioners, the serious practitioners on one level, they could care less about science. If it wasn't the Dalai Lama saying, please do this for the benefit of humanity, if it wasn't the Rinpoche's you're talking about, please do this for the benefit. These practitioners are saying like, we don't need your science. We don't need, again, a little strong language because they're so compassionate and kind. But on one level, it's like, we don't need that stuff. Our technologies work. We don't care what you're doing. We don't need you. But then you have the genius, the prescience of the Dalai Lama and others that are saying, hey, wait a second. We have these mental Olympians. We have these people that have 50, 60,000 hours of practice. And they operate at a bandwidth that really can, if scientifically validated, 
say, hey, wow, look at the potentiality of the human mind. Look at what the mind can do if it's trained in this way. And so to me, this is the cash value. We hit it when you said control, controlling our emotions, controlling our mind and heart. Because if we don't do that, we get what's happening in Ukraine right now. We get super samsara because people are unable to control the energies in their body, the emotions, and the winds, the thoughts in their mind. And so it's actually this lack of control that is tearing this world apart. And so I would suspect that with your ability to actually live both those worlds as a scientist and a practitioner, that somehow that inspires you to say, hey, wait a second, we've got real special techniques, technologies, capacities that the West should know about that can really help us in this darkest of all ages. Is that a fair thing to say? It, yes, and actually it goes the other way around as well, because in my, uh, I had a lot of discussion with Tibetan Rinpoche trying to defend or explain, because in Tibet, they think that science is something like at the level of engineering. They don't even understand what science is about, right. you know? So, so I had discussion with Rinpoche trying to convince them that it's also valid way of knowing, you know? And it can also bring amazing discoveries, yeah. you know? So, so it's just different ways of knowing. So science also has value. So, so it's kind of going both ways. And then for scientists, I'm trying to show, look, you know, these practices, Bajayana practices, they have amazing potential to uncover actual potential of human mind, how we can control our sympathetic system. I mean, how we can improve and enhance our visualization. We should not just discard, you know, these meditative practices. Absolutely. I, I couldn't agree more with you. And so let's be a little bit more, or, or let me ask you to be a little bit more articulate about um, we've talked a lot about the promises. And, and I, oh, I'm so with you on this. But let's 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 be a little bit more articulate about the perils. What are some of the hazards of doing this type of work? In other words, because once you establish metrics, it's there's a blessing and a curse with metrics, because then you're actually able to bring Western modalities of credibility into arenas that perhaps are not amenable to that sort of thing. And, and once, and then, I, I mean, I can envision all kinds of potential nightmarish scenarios of, of using these metrics to, to somehow study even levels of realization. But I'm curious what else you see have discovered for um, the general public and also for young scientists, people who are interested in studying this we've discussed the promises a little bit more about some of the admonitions, some of the perils of doing this type of work, because it, you're, you're walking on, on one level thin ice here, right? The danger of, you know, given information about these practices, their mechanism, this, I'm just trying to understand the danger in general, you know, for, for specific practitioner or the danger for society or what exactly your well, well, just the, just the danger of bringing these esoteric, I mean, there's a reason, um, and again, if it wasn't for the Dalai Lama and others, I don't think any of this would be in the public domain. Yeah. But but all these, you know, it's I, I, I when I did my practices and got my empowerments, I, I had to do the Samaya thing, where it's like code of secrecy. Yeah. You don't talk about this stuff, you don't go there. So, okay, so, so I think there are two things here. Yeah. First, it's a risk and danger for particular practitioner, and it's very valid. For example, this is all arousal flow states, extremely dangerous. They feel like, like drug. The person, you know, these, these athletes, they can run or jump until they just crash, just to feel this, this zone, you know, get into this, this zone state. You know, that video gamers can play games for weeks until they completely crash, the body crashes. So you cannot use resources of your body. This is latent resources of your body without paying really high price for that later. Mm -hmm. It's completely exhaust you, completely. It's burn your neural networks. It's completely exhaust your body. So you cannot function. And people don't understand. They get into these states, mm -hmm. which are really high drug states. They cannot get out and they completely kill and ruin themselves. Mm -hmm. So, um, so this is the first danger, you know, and then it's very easy to get like practicing tumor. It's very easy to get into extreme stress and get 
get you know like really weak heart out yeah. of it instead yeah. of you know psychic hit so like you really need to know what you're doing yeah. you really need to be able to control your passion your emotion to transform them really kind of in the right way so yes so this is why for a particular person these practices could be quite harmful without yes. supervision and without and then you mentioned you know samaya and mindfulness this is the basics on which you can build these arousal based practices without them you will get only into extremely stressful you know you can just be extremely yes. stressful you will never get you will never learn how to control this arousal so you really need to be prepared you need to have strong nervous system you need to have really calm and stable mind so so i understand but on the other hand you know, as ever, of course, there could be danger just exposing, you know, to people with bad intention, these practices. But on the other hand, as everything, there could be also benefit. Yeah. Because even to explain this video gamers or other people who are using the state completely wrong can kill them and ruin themselves, what it is, how to control, how to get out safely from these states, it also could bring a lot of benefit, you know. And also, two more, if again used correctly, I'm not talking about like really high level tumor practices, but some preliminaries or gentle breathing. Yep. It can have amazing medical effects. Yep. Amazing, you know, it can heal brain for a lot of traumas. So, um, so there is a lot of good might come out. Of course, there is danger always, but there is also positive things as well. That's that's the essence of Tantra, right? And, and yeah. I, I actually wrote a recent article for Tarka Magazine um, entitled i'll send it to you is the west ready for tantra i'll send it to you because yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no, go ahead yeah. yeah yeah i just wanted to say that um that you know maybe the west is not ready for tantra yet you know but but we don't want to lose yes. you know these yes. these kind of heritage because if you yes. if you lose them that's it how you know this absolutely is absolutely I, and I, I think that's incredibly important and that's where i completely agree with you because these are unusual times, to put it mildly. And, and if we don't take some of these amazing technologies developed by some of the most refined spiritual minds in the history of the world, not only will these practices go extinct, we're going to go extinct. So this is an extreme time that requires so-called extreme measures. And, and this is where I, I agree with the genius of the Dalai Lama, the prescience of some of these Rinpoches that are saying, hey, 40 years ago, we wouldn't be doing this. But we need to do it right now because otherwise all this stuff is going to go, go away. But I do want to say one more thing for the listeners here is that this is important. When we're talking about these types of things, my languaging, uh, Maria, but these are prescription strength meditations. Don't do, it's, it's like the commercial, don't try this at home. People listen to this, they go, oh, wow, this sounds so sexy. I'll be the first person on my block drying sheets in the middle of winter. Oh, Lordy. I mean, don't even think about that. In order to do these practices properly, the intention has to be there. It has to be pure. You have to have decades of preparatory work. It's like trying to understand quantum mechanics without doing arithmetic. It's not going to work. And not only is it not going to work, instead of lighting you up, it will burn you up. These practices, when you target these energetics, they can become very problematic if they're not harnessed properly and related to. And so this is a complete disclaimer for those listening. I am not, we are not endorsing these practices for those who don't do the necessary nundro, the preparatory work, the decades of, of, of practice in order to do these practices safely and effectively. Because otherwise, because they are so powerful, they can become very problematic. The other thing here is also worth mentioning is there is a difference between, and I have to be a little careful here because I, I don't want to criticize anybody, but performance tumo, performance tumo, the, the Iceman, the, the, all the stuff that you see where, oh, I'm going to do this now for these kind of performance um, modalities. One always has to check one's motivation when one engages on these sorts of things. And so the performance aspect of this is something that really needs to be kept in check, in my opinion, um, because that can run a little bit out of control. The last thing, not the last thing, but the next thing I want to ask you around this, um, Maria, is, and, and forgive me here because I, I, I love neuroscience, but I'm a dilettante. I'm not a neuroscientist. But I'm very interested in a couple of things in your work. One is 
they're, collect, they're connected. One is the connection of mind to brain. And in how, like for instance, in, in my study, uh, I, I think of instance, and you can correct me if this is like, well, that's not really valid research, that kind of thing. But in the work of like Candace Pert, I can mention names because it's in the public domain. She goes um, in her, her work, um, the neurophenomenologist, um, she talks about, um, psychoneurophenomenologist, she talks about her maxim is your body is your unconscious mind. So I'll start with that. She says that. And then I'm also curious, like when you study the mind and you're doing the imaging with EEGs and, and whatnot in the brain, I'm wondering about the place of heart neurites, what are the neurons in your heart center? I'm also worried, not worried, I'm also interested in, in how the, the so-called second brain in your GI system and your gut, does your work also embrace studying the, the neurophenomenological aspects that occur in the heart and in the gut and not just in this three pounds of jello in, in the skull? But, but see, arousal, just, just so, so the theory, the mechanism, how this state work, they're based on arousal. But arousal, this is actually our body. This is physiological response of our body to arousing stimuli. And it automatically trigger responses in the brain. For example, it's automatically trigger enhancing of focused attention. So the blood flowing into main arteries in the brain, which enhance your attentional capacity. But it's about body, you know, it's not about mind. We actually measure, I measure heart rate to measure the level of variability. Yep. To measure heart rate variability. So it's all connected. You cannot really tear this apart. Beautiful. And um, you know, like tumor, it's breathing, which actually contributes to arousal. It's brain, it's cognitive capacity visualization contribute to arousal and then arousal gives you know rise to focused attention to enhance and focus attention so it's absolutely all connected Fantastic. and you know just yeah and this is about tantric practices look because they're really built on body they built on body yeah. on emotion on passion on cognitive capacity on everything yeah. this is not probably the same about Theravada or other Southeast yeah. Asia practices where trying actually to transcend, right, the body. So, but it's especially true about Vajrayana, you're really putting everything together. That's fantastic. That's that's exactly what I was, was wanting to hear and to express. It's, it's like we said at the outset that my understanding of Tantra, one of the chief characteristics versus Sutra is body is as important as mind. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And really one way, one way I look at this is this kind of dual aspect monism where body is very gross mind, mind is very subtle body, and that you're working with this, this interstate commerce, right? Traffic between yeah. the two. And mm -hmm. I think that's really beautifully important because again, no criticism, but one of the limitations that I've seen in, in, in a fair amount of, of conventional neuroscience neuroimaging is in fact, the imaging that's that's relegated in in that brain, right? Everything is like looking for specific, not just neural cogn uh, correlates, but specific cranial correlates. And your work expands that. Your work works with all these different dimensions of the psychosomal um, connection, right? Yeah, but there are a lot of theories like theory of embodied cognition. You know, they they actually try to bridge, to bridge these together, body and mind and brain. And so where do you settle it? And again, if you don't want to go here, that, that's fine. But it, you, you're a unique individual in that you wear these two hats as an authentic practitioner. And I think, honestly, my intuition is that if you weren't that, you probably wouldn't have had much success getting into the studies of the people that you did. Because you, you have this dance, this capacity to work between those two worlds. But I, I, if I might ask you, what is your view of the relationship of mind to brain, uh, do you do you feel that mind can be reduced to the brain? Do you think that it's just a correlation, or or what? I'm curious as a scientist and a practitioner, do you subscribe to the more kind of conventional view that everything can be reduced to to um, cranial capacities? As a scientist, you know it's, it's difficult to answer because <laughs> as a scientist or as a Tibetan practitioner, I would give completely different answers. So. <laughs> So one, one part of you would probably say yes. The other part of you would probably be more agnostic. I mean, I don't want to put words in your mouth. <laughs> yeah. I also, it's like a little bit like, I also don't want to ruin your political career, right? <laughs> 
no, and then you see, I found it. This is this is what I want to mention. I found okay. it very useful when I'm thinking about science to think exactly like scientists. Yeah. And when I'm doing Vajrayana practices, yeah. I'm doing them as Vajrayana practitioner. I don't mix the two because they use completely, completely different terminology, language, understanding of the world. Now, I just want to tell you, I found it not very useful. And probably this is this is not a good thing, you know, like politically what I'm going to say. I found it not very useful to train people in both, you know, uh, these contemplative studies, which train people neuroscience, and they also give them some background of meditation. Yeah. I found them not very useful, I'll explain huh. why. Because they don't give enough training in neuroscience yeah. to allow these people to do kind of basic neuroscience break breakthrough. And they don't give them enough you know, framework of, uh, let's say, Tibetan Buddhism. So, so they have some kind of hybrid training, but they cannot make breakthrough yeah. in either, you yeah. know? So, yeah. so I would, you know, I would think that, let's say, collaborations between great neuroscientists and great Tibetan practitioners, I think this would be a more promising model, yeah. you know, if you can find people who, who want to collaborate. The, the Rather than trying to create a hybrid model, right? You I understand why they're doing this because they wanted yeah. people who do neuroscience to give some idea about meditation. But in the long run, I don't think it will give major breakthrough. And this is why when I'm when I'm doing scientific research, I'm doing it yeah. absolutely it's as scientific. a scientist. I don't bring yeah. anything beyond that, Beautiful. and I'm looking at the problem. Limited scientist, you know that. Yeah, <laughs> uh, you know, in my languaging, there there is something to be said for a separation of church and state, and I think that's one way to talk about this. But but again, because you you wear these two hats, I can see how that could be both a blessing and a curse Gen for you. Gentle bridges. So you build gentle bridges in the places where you see you can you capable of you know putting these bridges. So both sides can cross this bridge and understand what you're talking Absolutely. about. You're not trying to do to build these bridges somewhere where. <laughs> there will be complete misunderstanding, you know, from both exactly. sides. Yeah. So, so can I ask you, Maria, what did one precede the other? In other words, were you a scientist before you became a tantrika? Or were you engaged in, in these practices and then the science came in? Or can you say a little I, bit about? I was a complete like scientist, <laughs> fully, fully scientist. I grew up in scientific family. My parents, physics, you know, physicist, my dad physicist, mom mathematician. So I grew up in a completely scientific materialistic, you know, with completely scientific materialistic worldview. So it's only later, you know, with my life. So then when I, my first trip to Nepal in 2005, mm -hmm. I actually stay in Nepal for another two years, extended my sabbatical. Then I returned back to Nepal for another year. Then actually was the reason why I took this position in the National University of Singapore where I can do these field studies. So I spent probably the last 15 years, probably half of my time wow. in the monasteries of Bhutan, wow. Thailand, Tibet, Nepal, all these countries, yeah. you know? So it completely changed my, you know, <laughs> limited scientific worldview. Yeah. But, yeah. And that's, I mean, I would say, and I don't, don't let me be assumptive here and speak for you, but I would think that that's probably quite a beautiful thing. I mean, in, in terms of opening again, it's, it's so I don't want to become presumptuous and like somehow the superiority of the spiritual view. I'm not trying to say that, but I also realize the, the strengths and the limitations of both science and spirit, that on one level, science has tremendous uh, um, rigor, articulation, clarity, and part of that incisiveness can lead to closure, closed-minded thinking. You know, it's like, I, I heard, I, no kidding, Marie, I heard one esteemed scientist once say, about some, some principles in the spiritual community. Literally, he said, I wouldn't believe it even if it was true. I mean, that, <laughs> that's, that's and you, you laugh because you know, right? You laugh because you know. Yeah, I know, yeah. <laughs> and so that, they're, they're near enemies and near friends. So the near enemy of this type of, you know, super shamata, articulate, intelligent, precise, is this kind of provincial territorial mind closure. And then, of course, the, the near enemy of, of the spiritual thing is, is, is sometimes a mind that's so open, that's so, so acquiescent or whatever. But there, there are also near enemies related to that. And so, therefore, I think being able to centrifuge the strengths and weaknesses of those two disciplines is really quite beautiful. Um, but it's very interesting. This is actually was one of, one of the questions I had for you 
was um, how has your research changed you? I mean, outside of the scientist and the discoveries, which is, they're amazing, right? But fundamentally, isn't it true? Maybe I speak for myself. I change when I feel things. I mean, I can think about, I philosophize, I love to think, I, I, I can get all wrapped up in that. But if I want to be fundamentally transformed, I have to feel something. And so I'm curious, how has your research affected you, changed you, transformed you? What, what insights um, has it brought to you in, in your spiritual? Because you say you centrifuge them out, but I think on one level, it can't help. You know, No matter how many borders we create, we have this kind of porosity towards ourselves, right? So I'm curious how your research has affected you and changed you. So it's actually how like Vajrayana Tibetan view actually affected a lot my research in the sense that mm -hmm. it removed closed mindedness, you know, like being in all this monastery, I saw things which could never be explained using current scientific, you know, knowledge. So, and uh, I actually believe them. I saw them and I believe them because this mm. is what I saw. Yeah. And uh, so, so it completely removed my closed mindedness, you know, in my scientific research. So now I really kind of really trying, really, really trust in my results instead of trying to put them to kind of fit them into previous model and trying to mm. really see what they mean. Oh, so it completely cool. changed, it completely changed the way I'm doing my research, you know? So I never, I never try to fit it into whatever I said before or, you know, or existing models. I'm really trying to get something new and see how it works. So it changed my way I'm doing research. And uh, I think and change the way I actually doing everything in my life. So way more open-minded, way more flexible, flexible. And then you understand limitation of both mm. fields. You know, you understand limitation of science and you understand limitation, yep. even let's say of Tibetan Buddhist philosophy. Yep. So those are different systems of knowledge and, you know, and they both have limitation yep. and they could be useful for different things. So you become more flexible and um, yeah, that's an well, more open-minded. Fantastic, fantastic. And so if, if I might ask you further, because I, I find this actually very inspiring. You're saying this, but I want to be a little bit perhaps more targeted. Ch literally changing the way you perceive, right? Changing yeah. the way you see the world. Yeah, exactly. are you able? Are you able to address that? Do you feel comfortable? Yeah, I mean, how, how is it? How has it changed the way you perceive the world? Yeah, actually, it's a very interesting comment because you know our perception and there is all these theories you know predictive coding about perception yep. which are very popular right now that you actually perceive only what you actually expect to perceive you know so so the learning can still occur but it's limited you know because the visual system works in the way that it actually enhances stimuli which you expect to see and inhibits stimuli which you don't expect to see outside. Filters away. Yeah. Yeah. So what it actually doing to people? They live in a quiet, they live in kind of virtual reality in, yeah. in some sense, yeah. you know, yeah. which they create themselves. So um I think it's one way to break this virtual reality, actually, to to take this view that um anything could be out there, you know, you're not, you're not kind of going with any particular view of the yep. world yep right you, you're not going you're not sticking to any particular view of the world because the world could be way more richer than you know your particular fantastic. view suggests you fantastic <laughs> i i love i really i love hearing that because really to me it's like what you said earlier was i think so admirable because it, there's it's like it's like what happened with the advent of quantum mechanics and its reconciliation or lack thereof with newtonian physics People kept trying to fit the data into Newton's world and it didn't fit. Yeah. And so then basically that's how paradigms change, right? They change yeah, exactly. when you get yeah. when you get the data that just doesn't you fit. You cannot fit them any longer. It doesn't yeah. fit the old model. And so you have yeah. it's like an outdated operating system. You've got to let that model go. And that is revelatory for a lot of people who are so attached to those models. I had a conversation with Evan Alexander. He reminded me of, I mentioned the quote, then he attributed it to Max Planck, where he said beautifully, I love this quote, science proceeds advances funeral by funeral. 
<laughs> Isn't it true? It's like when the old when the old hearses go to the cemetery, then the new scientists come in with people like you and, and these wonderful other scientists I have the great honor of spending time with, where we, where our minds and hearts are opened. I love this narrative of openness. And, and we have models that expand our understanding of mind and reality. And, and what can be more powerful than that? I mean, that, that is a colossal contribution. And then for someone like you, who can bring that into a vocabulary that has such credibility in the Western world, the science speak, that's no small thing. Because then all of a sudden people, they listen. I mean, you, you the scientific community, I mean, they're the arbiters of truth these days. I mean, we, we, I mean, with some exception, but we tend to go there because of the rigor, the elegance, the, the, uh, the empiricism. There's tremendous cap capacity there. And so this is why I love interviewing, talking to scientists, because I have tremendous respect for science. The issue um, is not science. The issue is scientists, <laughs> right? <laughs> it's, what, it's what they do with science. That's the issue. It's not science. Science is beautiful. And it shares a lot of the empiricism, shares a lot with authentic contemplative traditions where you don't take things at face value, you test it empirically against your own experience, and then you see if it resonates with your worldview or not. Yeah, something like yes, that. Totally agree. <laughs> <laughs> so let me, we, we're circumambulating one, one central thing here that I want to talk to you very, uh, not briefly, but I want to land this with you. How, how, has your work in this narrative of, of expansion and opening and, and exploring the mysteries, you mentioned you were brought up in, in a scientific, materialistic, physicalistic environment, as many people are. How has that paradigm been challenged and even um, perhaps uh, overthrown? In other words, do you still, I mentioned this earlier when, when I asked you the question about the, the reducibility of, of mind to brain, do you still, and again, simply just open-hearted question. Do you subscribe to a worldview um, philosophically that would be idealistic in nature or a, a worldview that is materialistic? What, what is the fundamental explanatory um, or epistemic basis? Is it mind for you? Is it matter for you? What, where, where, what is the, the ontological primitive for you? I would say, you know, it's probably some kind of hybrid view. Hmm. Everything is energy, you know, like everything is energy and, and energy could be expressed as mind, could mm -hmm. be expressed as, you know, matter. So I would say like a physicist point of view, everything kind of energy. So, and even subtle body, this is energy. So everything is energy. And even, you know, this emptiness, for me, is just some kind of this universal energy, which, you know, science is trying to find some kind of universal energy, which bridge this electromagnetic and gravitational. Yeah, yeah. So maybe there is some kind of conscious energy and everything is energy. So that's probably not philosophical view, but yeah, fair kind of my feeling that. Yeah, fair enough. And again, please understand, I I'm not trying to pigeonhole you. I'm not trying to like, oh, say, oh, oh, I talked to Maria. Oh, she's just another <laughs> hardcore materialist, right? No, I'm not trying to go there. I'm genuinely interested because like, like you, I, I was brought up um, in a more medical community, not a scientific community, but I studied physics. I mean, I, I, I was, if I had to do it all over again, I would probably be a cognitive neuroscientist. I love this stuff. But I'm also very deeply, I mean, my primary trajectory is understanding reality, understanding mind. WTF is this thing called mind and reality. And for me, I think like you, I don't care where the answers come from. I don't care. I'm not picky about truth. And so that's why I, I love science. I love an integral approach using science and spirit and psychology, not necessarily putting all my eggs in one basket and then running, you know, hopefully not the risk of becoming a dilettante in all these different disciplines. But to me, it's, it's really honoring and incorporating the gifts, the wisdom that all these um, streams, these traditional streams going back thousands and thousands of years, and then the unbelievable advances over the last 100 years in the scientific community. And then sometimes really getting blinded by that light, because sometimes the hubris that's associated with the explanatory power of science, that can be a problem. 
Because, you know, as my friend Bernardo Kastrup says, science doesn't, um, doesn't describe what reality is. It describes what reality does. And so I would argue that science can fundamentally, it's actually incapable of answering these fundamental questions. And so that's why, um, I mean, that's me. That's just me talking. So. But what about quantum, you know, physics? You know, um, I think some of the view, you know, quantum physics are quite advanced. And uh, in some way they, in some way they might parallel, you know, I actually also have a graduate degree in theoretical physics. Hmm. <laughs> I didn't know that. Cool. Yeah. <laughs> Very cool. So from, from Moscow, you know, before I moved to the United States and Israel and then United States. But um, I think they have quite advanced, you know, view of reality, which in some sense, you know, parallel Zokshin view. Of course, not exactly, but there are some parallels which I found. So can you say, so, can I say a little bit more about that? Are you, are you comfortable talking a little bit more about what that is for you? Um, it's difficult put, you know, right now, I, I just need to prepare something sure. like, but it's difficult to talk immediately, but I sure. found when I was, you know, in Tibet, taking this auction, you know, teaching, I actually found a lot of parallel, but of course, in Tibetan language, of course, in a very different way, but they were talking about, about similar things. So, so I think there is potential in science, you know, <laughs> to explain to explain the world in a different way than in Tibetan Buddhism, not an experiential yeah. way, but but I I have high high hopes for science yeah. you know, in the future, yeah. especially for physics. By the way, about cognitive neuroscience, yeah. I think it's cognitive neuroscience still didn't make that bridge to physics yet. Yes. It's also quite a new field, you know. Yeah. So so I. I actually expect way more discoveries in cognitive neuroscience and future when it finally makes a bridge with, you know, with quantum physics, with contemporary physics. I think that it has a lot of potential, way more well, potential than now. It's certainly one of the more exciting arenas, is it not? And, yeah. and, and like you, again, I don't want to be a dilettante, but the work of Andre Lind and Anton Zeilinger, I mean, there's some amazing individuals out there now yeah. that, are that are talking about reality in a way that is highly resonant with contemplative assertions. Yeah. But, then, but yeah. then one of the questions here that we always have to be aware of are category errors. Where just, just because the particular, they're using the same languaging, these are multivalent terms. They're, they're, just because you're using the same term, same signifier, doesn't always mean the same signified. And I think that's where a lot of confusion comes in because you think they're saying the same thing, but are they really? So this is an open question for me. I, I mean, I love Francesco Varela's approach to the power of an open question, being truly agnostic and just saying, hey, I don't know. And I'm okay, I'm comfortable saying, I don't know. And then allowing the world to arise. Instead of coming in with your predispositions, your confirmation biases, all the other um, crap shows that we bring in that stains our perceptions and stains our so-called data, right? Yeah, yeah. So, <laughs> so when you look into the future, Maria, as a scientist, what excites you? What, what, when you look your, into your crystal ball, um, what really gets you up in the morning and what, what excites you about not only your work, but where you see um, neuroscience going all together? For neuroscience, I think, you know, um, I think where, where I hope it will go, as I mentioned, to make more you know, bridges with electromagnetic, you know, theories, you know, to really look at the brain as, you know, electromagnetic phenomena, which is not currently happening, you know. So I, I actually expect new theories, you know, some advances, even analyzing this neuroimaging data and formulating theories, long way to go. So uh, as for my own research, what I'm really interested in is actually to, to understand in depth this enhanced cognitive states because the topic is much more broader. We, you interested in lucid dreaming, but what I found in my research that lucid dreaming is kind of a state of flow in a sleeping, in a sleeping state, you know? So because it shows exactly the same neural correlates. So it's the same kind of arousal during sleep. So um, I 
read a lot about near-death phenomena, mm -hmm. and they're talking about this temporal lucidity, which mm -hmm. actually very similar to mm -hmm. these enhanced cognitive states. So taken broadly, what are those uh, altered state of consciousness? Mm -hmm including lucid dreaming, including near-death experiences, including states of flow, what is common, mm -hmm. what we can actually understand, you know, and then about perception, as you mentioned, it's, it's extremely interesting, you know, what we see, it could be just completely blocked by our expectation and yeah. our kind of top-down ideas, you know, so a series of perception in the future, this is, I think, a very interesting topic yeah. as well, so this is what I'm interested to to follow. Fantastic. So we, we haven't said much about this. And so if you have a little bit more energy to speak a little bit more about the, the lucid dreaming aspect of it, like what, because this is a um, very interesting comment you just said, that lucid dreaming um, has these flow state kind of correlates. Can you say a little bit more about that in your work with lucid dreaming? So um, what is interesting, you know, the studies that show that how I got to the idea that it might be the state of flow in a sleep during sleep is because all these studies, new studies in psychology that shows that video gamers, and this is video gamers, like first person shooter aggressive video games, they actually experience lucid dreaming spontaneously. Yeah. Much more often, even yeah. more often than even, you know, those who who using all these lucid dreaming techniques or doing a lot of mindfulness meditation and you know so, so what's going on here and because these video gamers actually going easily to the state of flow my uh, hypothesis was that probably the state of flow if you know how to get into the state of flow during your waking state probably you can easily get spontaneously experience lucid dream in your sleeping state and actually this hypothesis is confirmed because, you know, I, I did, I interview people, I did survey across, you know, like large sample, it was video gamer musicians, and actually it's not video gaming, which correlate with um, frequency of lucid dreams. It's actually how often they experience flow in their waking life. Mm. So, uh, and then, mm. If you look at neural correlates of EG correlates of lucid dreaming, you actually see that they're very similar to those in some way, not, not fully, but you know, you can see quite similarity with those experienced by monks when they're doing the self-visualization or by video gamers when they experience, you know, the states of flow. So, and then we have we have research from I think Laberge was the first to show that during lucid dreams the body shows a state of arousal. You mm -hmm. know, you can actually measure this. So lucid dreaming happened during the state of arousal. So I think it's really some kind of parallel of flow in during, during the dream state. And so where, where, where in your sequence of studies did this fit in? Because it went, in the papers that you sent me, it wasn't clear to me where, where where did this fit into your it's work? It's not published yet. It's not ah. published yet. I'm just collecting the data, but... Ah. Um, it's what I'm trying to, my next paper, <laughs> which I'm trying to finish right now, is just to show that it corresponds to all characteristics of flow. Even in terms of attention, perception, it's really resemble, you know, the state of flow. Of course, there are some um, differences because it's a sleep state, you know, but physiologically, it seems to be very similar. Also the body resting you in sleep, but your heart rate is exactly the same, you know, heart rate variability, you see the same patterns as monks doing self-visualization during the day. That's just so interesting, isn't it? And so, so again, because you're, you're uniquely qualified to answer these types of questions, what is your understanding of the relationship? And, and I, again, like you, the work of Mihai, if, if you can pronounce his name, you, you get a Nobel Prize, right? Mihai Chik Chik Mihai, right? Mihai? <laughs> <laughs> if you can pronounce his name, you get a Nobel Prize. Yeah. <laughs> he, he's, a, he's a Czech researcher. He wrote the, yeah. the classic book, yeah. Flow, and then the following. What is your understanding of flow states and what Buddhists talk about is samadhi or absorption states? Would you say that they're synonymous? What, what are the similarities and differences between samadhi states and flow states? Okay, so, so they're different. So they use flow state, let's say Vajrayana practitioners, they okay. use flow states 
to experience samadhi mm. in a in a higher in a different level so this is mm. why i believe the experience samadhi using theravada or vipassana meditation would be different because they are done in a very relaxed state you mm. know it's still so, so like a pre a pre-flow state is what you're saying yes, right yeah yep. but so continue but, i'm sorry i cut you off uh, no, actually, it's not even pre-flow. It's just a different state, like Theravada style of uh, Samadhi. Now, Vajrayana style, it's different because mm. they use flow states to experience Samadhi differently. And mm. here I just want to say a few words because I actually compare, compare Mahamudra, you mm -hmm. know, like non-tantric Mahamudra, yep. usually performed by people after Vipassana style meditations, right? versus Mahamudra performed after mm -hmm. generation stages or even mm -hmm. after Tumor. So they show very different neural correlates, but these neural correlates actually show very different mechanisms, cognitive mechanisms behind these two types of Mahamudra. And I just want to mention like quickly uh, that you see different type of attention networks involved and different type of attention control. So what is attention control? It controls all attention. It actually shut down default network, you know, to create this type of samadhi. So during Theravada, during non-tantric Mahamudra, what you see, you see specific level of attentional control mm -hmm. directed at maintenance specific state mm -hmm. and at shutting down default network. Oh, and wow. it's very effortful type of uh, mental state because you constantly need to, you know, to shut down, you constantly need to lessen this mental, you know, stuff which is going on in default network. Now you don't, you don't see it. So what happened during the state of arousal? A totally different type of attentional control take, take place here. Mm -hmm. Because during arousal, first of all, you don't need to fight anymore trying to shut down default network. Actually, there is no cognition at all happening during state of arousal. Why? Because you need to, to deal with arousing stimuli. So all irrelevant stuff shut down automatically. Mm -hmm. Like mm -hmm. think about like people during the accident and state of arousal, yeah. adrenaline rush, you yeah. cannot think about your problem they're gone you're completely fully you know to deal with the situation the same in the battlefield the same during creative processes of visual artists or athletes so it's totally it's automatically shut down all irrelevant you know stuff in the brain so it's less affordable you're already in a state of a flow it's a different type of attention now coming into play which is focused attention and uh so it probably feels differently it should feel differently and it's based on different um kind of different type of lucidity you know so and this is why i think in lucid dreaming this is the only type of lucidity possible this is why it happened during arousal because you don't need effort to shut down everything irrelevant it's already shut down during sleep you know that is so interesting and so i don't want to get too technical so we don't have roadkill for the non-scientist yeah. here yeah. So it's, is it, you didn't mention the salience network. Is that also shut down? Yes, or yeah, exactly. During, during, during arousal and it's known, it's shut down because, um, so the whole thing, so the whole thing becomes almost automatic. So yeah. it's kind of really yeah. kind of automatic responses because everything, yep. you know, everything to win, everything to deal yep. with this arousing stimuli, yep. important emotional stimuli, wow. everything is there. So the body completely, it's a different networks become, <laughs> coming into play, everything relevant, all the distraction going on away. You know, these experiments with video gamers, they yeah. criticized because somebody fall down, somebody fall from the stairs, they yeah. don't see anything, they don't hear anything, not because they're so insensitive or antisocial, because they in flow, they only focus on what they focus, you know? So everything else relevant, all their problems, all external world, all goes away, you know, automatically. No. It sounds a little bit, do you know Naroda Samapati? Are you familiar with that state no. of absorption? Oh, too big of a topic. Um, I'll send you some stuff on it. And I'm interviewing a gentleman tomorrow who, who has proficiency in this type of ultimate kind of absorption. Mm -hmm. Whether it's a flow state, that would be a very interesting situation. But Ramana Maharshi, and apparently this individual <clears throat> can enter, look it up. I'll, I'll send you the link, Naroda mm -hmm. Samapati. It's a post-Janana state. So it would be it's sometimes called the ninth Jhana, jhana state 
where you can enter a, a type of suspended hibernation at will for like 10 days at a time where, where you're just, you're like flatland. There's, there's, there's this is no not flow. This is not flow. I know because um, I had one practitioner in Thailand who was actually able to do something similar. Yes. This is this is the other type of samadhi. They're just extremely proficient in that one. So they actually transcend the body and mind. They shut Different. down the mind and the body. But this is effortful. It's way more effortful. You need to exert effort to shut down, you know, your bodily function and your mental function. This well, is not flow. It's this is not the same. same. So, so, the... so this would tie back to what we talked about earlier. This would be more classic. Theravada and yes, exactly. samadhi yeah, exactly. versus yeah. tantric flow state. I mean, how interesting is this? This yeah, is this would not be tantric, Mahamudra or tantric. No, that, that would be classical. It's very difficult to get. It should be extremely professional, but it's a different type of. Yes, exactly. And then there's also, parenthetically, there's also some real debate about whether that it actually is, it's just, it's Niroda, but does that mean it's nirvana i mean is that just the type of graduate absorption state or is that in fact buddhahood yeah that's a really yeah. interesting question right because yeah. this is where the tantricas would say good for you but no cigar it's not mahamudra it's yeah. still some type of really um super elite type of absorption state yeah. um which is again it's incredibly interesting to study so is it fair to say and sorry if i get excited because this stuff is so cool to me but is it fair to say that when you enter these flow states, when the default mode network is, is uh, um, temporarily arrested, salience network shuts down, is it fair to say that, that I'm, you, I'm looking for a larger rubric here, that referentiality shuts down? In other words, these are completely non-referential experiences because both default mode network and salience networks are all based on some reference, some level of, line of contraction to self. Fair to say that that is then arrested or temporarily obtunded, or, or can you say if that's appropriate and what might be happening along those lines? I think it's actually everything going down and lesson because um, how to explain this? So this is top-down influences. All our, you know, referential, you know, connection and everything. This is all top-down influence based on our previous knowledge, right? So um, the top-down system is really not working during mm -hmm. high states of arousal, again, because it's not relevant for survival, mm -hmm. you know? So um, mm. they, they, cut, they cut off, you know? So I think that's, th that's why I think it's so interesting because this Mahamudra, Tantric Mahamudra really yeah. kind of very clever use of, you know, this state of arousal, high energy state, which actually helps them, you know, yeah. to get to this kind exactly. of state. Exactly, yeah. which would be almost antithetical and sometimes yeah, exactly. Exactly. Yeah. and exactly. counterintuitive exactly. even, you know, you wouldn't expect, they, yeah. They, yeah. you would expect meditation as really yeah. relaxation, but here they really kind of try to go the other way around and play with completely different things. Fantastic. I which mean, actually give you give you the result much quicker, but yes. way more dangerous. Exactly, more dangerous. exactly. And that's the whole risk reward factor of Tantra. Yeah. yeah Quick exactly. path, enlightenment in one life. But again, if it's not done rightly, rightly, if it's not done properly, it doesn't light you up, it burns you up. And, and I, I'll, I'll, I can't say too much about this, but I know from experience in retreat and people who've done these retreats, there's these sokwong, these wind disorders. You may be familiar with those. These are classic wind disorders that if you don't do this stuff properly, again, big disclaimer, don't do this at home. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> this yeah. stuff can become a serious problem. There's a reason this is postdoc work in the spiritual community. Not again to say that who does this is somehow elite. No, no, no. It's just this is a, a, a more subtle, refined mm -hmm. technology that really, on one level, the way I relate to this, uh, Maria, is what the, the genius and the danger of the tantras is it goes, they, they use the nomenclature, you, you probably heard of it, it penetrates the vital points. These practices go to the nintig, to the heart essence of samsara. And therefore, if that, if that target, if that acupuncture needle, metaphorically, isn't delivered properly, and you don't know where to place it and how to work with it, brace yourself, right? Because yeah. the energies yeah. can, can completely send you off, and there, again, there's a reason why these things are prescription state practices. So we always need to bear that in mind. But yet the work that you're doing is so insightful and so revolutionary. It's like, I, I can't help but get excited. So 
One last topic, I could talk to you all day, but one last topic, because I know your time is busy. We've been hinting at this, but we haven't targeted it directly. And to me, this is Tantra Mahamudra um, and so-called non-duality. We can use those carefully as isomorphisms, but maybe not, maybe they're maybe not equivalent. Have you done work with this officially, like so-called studying non-duality, virtually synonymous with enlightenment? Have you done work with this? Have you found things in, in your, um, both in the literature, you're more familiar with this than I am, and also in your own work or even future work, studying um, Tantra Mahamudra or so-called non-duality specifically. Can you say a little bit about that? Um, and again, it will be a bit more technical, but I will try to explain. So I study these practitioners in Tibet who was doing these, um, I'm not saying they get to enlightenment, but they were doing this Mahamudra non-dual type of Mahamudra for like 30 years, some of them. So it's like very long time. And they consider to be expert practitioners. So what I found again, comparing comparing between tantric mahamudra, non-tantric mahamudra, and um, open monitoring type of meditation, yeah, such open, as vipassana, mindfulness, and so on. So, so what is common between um, open monitoring and non-tantric mahamudra? Mm -hmm they both done in deep relaxation, mm -hmm. right? And then specific type of attentional control common to them and specific mm -hmm. time of sustained attention. So tantric Mahamudra non-dual is different because it's again arousal, it's arousal type of control, it's focused attention. Now, but there are things common to both types of Mahamudra, which actually differentiates them from open monitoring styles. And what happening here is that it's interesting. If you look at EG data, you see gamma power going down. So it decreases. Where all other types of meditation, open monitoring, focused attention, any other type, you see gamma power increasing. So what it means, gamma power, I mean, according to contemporary theory, means clarity of perception, object binding. So which mean clarity of perception. So what is going on here? Clarity of perception going down, but it's not going down. The object stop binding. Exactly. It means, it exactly. means you see what I'm saying? Totally. It means you don't perceive them totally. in the way you perceive them in your usual state. Totally. So it's, it's basically measuring a de-reified state. You're, you're, yes. you're basically measuring a state of non-duality where there's a lack of reification, hence there's no binding, and hence gamma then dissipates. Exactly. Oh yeah. my goodness. And that was wow. very, it was very unusual result, you know, because you see in the literature on meditation recently, you can see everywhere papers coming out that gamma increase is a signature, is a marker of meditation. So when first yeah. I did the study with Dzogchen practitioner in Sechen, I, we saw actually gamma decrease yeah. and we couldn't understand back then what's going on, you know? Yeah. But then like later with in Tibet and Bhutan, it's consistent, clear increase. But during tantric Mahamudra, you see way more significant decrease than during non-tantric Mahamudra. And again, this is because of the state of arousal, you just more equipped to deal with the things. But yet, even during non-tantric Mahamudra, you still see decrease in gamma. So it also works in the same direction. It's, it, sends, it actually sends a chill up my back. And so again, I want to be a little careful to my listeners, but I, they, have to, <laughs> they have to indulge me for just a second because this is so rare to talk about this. So, so does, does gamma then cease and is it delta or what, what is left? Is, is, there, is there something ah, that's no, no, left? No. Um, during Mahamudra, so no, we, we, there are other brain waves going different direction, but they mean something different. So let's say 
alpha going up during non-tantric Mahamudra, alpha going down during tantric Mahamudra, but this is different processes. Okay. But if to look, let's say beta and gamma, beta and gamma probably combination would be the best, um, yep. the best combination to look at yep. because now it's really beta and gamma in combination, which actually correspond to this object binding yep. or predictive coding states. Yep. So what happened in both goes down, both beta and gamma goes down during um, both types of tantric and non-tantric type of Mahamudra, which means that object binding kind of stops. I, it wouldn't it be fair to say that it's not just merely object binding, it's just yes. basically object period, right? Yes, exactly. <laughs> because yes, object, exactly. object binding, it, it's almost a bi-directional co-immersion process, right? Yes, the object exactly. arises and you bind to it. So when yes. the object is dereified, there's nothing to bind to, and hen, hence both go up in smoke because they lean on each other. Yeah, exactly. Fair enough exactly. to say? Yeah, fair enough to say. And that's again, talking about predictive coding, the predictive coding break Predictive states, you know, they they broke, they, they don't work. You don't predict anymore. So all so predictive see, so predictive processing is arrested then. Yes, arrested. So you see the world as it is. I mean, exactly, ideally, right? And so top, so all, all top-down processes cease. Cease, yeah. Oh my goodness. I mean, it just it just sends chills up my back. It's now so again, of course, I didn't show that they completely cease, but you need to be enlightened, but you clearly see significant yeah. decrease, which yeah. usually you never see in any other type of meditation. Ever. Exactly. You see increase. Exactly. Wow. Wow. And so how replicable are these? I mean, are, are we able to find more It's than... absolutely replicable because I couldn't believe this data when I first, you know, measure on session practitioner, they show gamma decrease and beta decrease. I thought, what What's you know, going on? completely completely against everything yeah, you know yeah. and then i found the same pattern in tibet and then now the same pattern in bhutan you know so but wow and i did different types of experimental design different type of you know like variation control group and you clearly can see this pattern whenever you're talking about non-dual meditation you see this pattern everywhere more in tantric exactly. way more in tantric but you still see it in non-tantric mahamudra as well that's just, it's breathtaking to me. And so uh, I keep saying one last thing and there's always like, wait, there's one more, wait, there's one more. <laughs> so hopefully, last one, hopefully. Sleep yoga, luminosity meditation, um, formless practice in deep, dreamless sleep. Any studies that you've done with that or any potentialities of exploring a lucidity and deep, dreamless sleep? I really wanted to do it. You know, I actually collected data from two or three before before COVID in Bhutan, two or three practitioners from Bhutan who were doing these practices during night and I have all this equipment. But um, unfortunately, I didn't have chance to continue. So maybe maybe next year, but I'm really interested in this in this topic actually. Were you collecting some data that was exciting yeah. to you? I mean, some provisional Yeah, but data. it's only two, three data. Actually, yeah. it's only two. The third one was full, full of noise, you know, but but yeah. it was it was kind of really interesting. But yeah. you cannot get much from two people. Yeah. I really need a bit more a bit more yeah. of these studies. But I mean, this is the stuff really is it's it, these are the the data bases that start to change paradigms because what do you do with this stuff? How, how does it fit into current models of perception and cognition? Because again, it, it, it's so challenging because by default, we live in a dualistic reality, subject, object, consciousness connecting. I, I would say, in fact, the tradition says consciousness doesn't connect, consciousness separates, wisdom connects. And so therefore this whole, this whole exploration of what you're doing is really bringing just tremendous groundbreaking credibility to challenging the dualistic paradigm. And again, to, to close, start to close on cash value. Okay, so here we are talking almost two hours, like what are the real world, world implications? They could not be more profound because if you start to de-reify a dualistic reality, which can seem so abstract, philosophical, spiritual, this is the source of all our suffering. It's the source of every level of, of dissonance that's happening at, at political, social, environmental, ecological levels. It all comes down to these fundamental principles. And it's therefore our inability to understand these extremely refined states that basically gives birth to this whole crap show we know as samsara. And so basically what you're doing is you're, you're coming back to the construction site, a process of de-automatization, deconstruction, coming back to the ground zero in a real way <laughs> that really has tremendous, not only explanatory, but curative power. 
it then can really be, I, I see so much cash value here about how this can be extrapolated, translated into ways that just have so much applicability in the world today. And to me, that's what's so bloody exciting. It's not just this armchair esoteric scientists in the back room doing this super crazy stuff. This stuff really, when you understand it, whoa. I mean, it has some real traction in the real world. So I, I applaud you, Marie. It's been such a delight. Couple things. Any question that you have, would have wanted me to ask? Any final things that you want to share with us before we close? Any, anything left out? We've covered so much, but I wanna make sure there's some sweet spot perhaps that I didn't get for you. Probably not. Probably <laughs> we discuss everything. <laughs> we cover everything. Cool. Cool. <laughs> and then, and then a, a little bit more about how can people. Uh, we'll we'll post your bio and links to your to your uh, um, site and whatnot. But how can people learn more about you? Because um, one of the things that we try to do is is introduce people to each other, cross pollinate support, and um, just try to facilitate as much as we can with the guests that we bring online. So how can people learn more about you? How can they support you on what you're doing? Um, so I probably will send you, if you can just circulate my website, link to my okay. website, all the papers there, they can be downloaded. So, um, and I also want to mention that I'm writing a book on Tumor. Oh, it's, it would not be fully scientific. It would be kind of with more even description of how difficult it was to get to these subjects and what they're actually doing in this experiment Ex during you know, my experiments and how difficult it was to get them and how they live there in Bhutan and Tibet. So I hope I, hope I will be able to publish it by um, summer, end of summer. Uh, I mean, not this one. Excellent. <laughs> the next one, yeah. So, but oh, I'm in the process in the middle. So, yeah. Well, that's got to be kind of fun to get to get break out of the scientific writing paper mode yeah, and actually exactly. write a popular book. So, do you have a publisher yet? Do you have someone that you pitch to? I want or? to do self publishing. Actually, that's what I decided. Maybe it's not the best way, but I will do self publishing. Oh, good for you! I can't wait to read it. It's gonna. I'm sure it'll be a great contribution. And so, Maria, really, I, I I'm. It's so fun to finally make a connection. And I'm so impressed with the work that you're doing. The papers you sent me, it's like I couldn't stop reading them. They were like so rich. And my conversation was the same with you. It's been such a delight. And so really, thank you so much for taking time out of your busy schedule to chat with us. It means the world to me and to my audience and community. And, and um, let's definitely stay in close touch. And then until next time, let's stay lucid. <laughs> thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you for inviting me. It was real, really interesting conversation. Thanks a lot. I love it. I learned so much. Um, and so deep, deep of gratitude until next time. <laughs> Take care. Thank you, Andrew. Take care. Bye. -bye. Bye.